Good morning, or afternoon now, I guess. By the time I walk off the stage today, about 22 people would have died in a road crash somewhere in the world, and about 20 of those will be in low- to middle-income countries. There are 1.3 million deaths globally per year, and with human error contributing to about 93% of crashes, it's kind of easy to see why that perhaps replacing the human driver with an automated driver, we could drive that number down. So today, I want to talk a little bit about that claim, uh, and I want to uh, just ask us, ask us to consider whether the way we're approaching the development of driverless cars is consistent with that. But first, um, I think there's a few themes that have come through the event uh, that are relevant to what I want to talk about today. The first is the amazing amount of energy and passion that automated vehicle technology is receiving in all of the presentations and in all of the people here. And I think I've been amazed by the variety of it as well. The second is that it's put us in a place where we don't exactly know how it's going to play out. We don't understand what the future is going to look like. So the unpredictability is extraordinary. But perhaps one thing we can be sure of is that there is no vision of a future transition to an automated mobility ecosystem that does not involve us humans on some level. Now, one thing that I find is that if I'm asked what I do, if, if I'm asked, uh, and I say that I research driverless cars or driver behavior in driverless cars, more often than not, people are genuinely interested in that. And I, and I have some deep discussions, and I get lots of questions. And I think partly it's because this topic runs deep with so many people, because most people drive or are driven, uh, or at least are fascinated by this future world they hope to be a part of. But like I said, no one has a clue what the world will look like even in five years' time. And yet we're meant to be preparing for that future. What I also find extraordinary is the capacities that we know some drivers have. Rally drivers, for example, and their capacities for precise motor control, hazard perception, spatial awareness, and effective communication, all in really high-pressure situations. And they are exceptional, and this is exceptional. But these are highly trained, highly experienced, and skilled drivers collaborating with equally capable co-drivers. Now, I'm sure it's no news to you that this does not represent the average driver or the average driver's experience. And remember, I said that human error is a contributing factor in 93% of crashes. And I say that to highlight the challenge we face here, because the average driver makes mistakes. And I'm going to correct myself and say there is no average driver. That 93% is brought about by a myriad of factors of experiences, of cultures, of ages, of histories, of genders. So that number does not represent one thing. Secondly, I don't use this statement to justify the use of automation like a lot of people do, because self-driving cars will not be perfect, infallible drivers because we can expect system, system errors, latent bugs, system failures. I've personally experienced some of these myself on the road, and they're, <laughs> they, they're pretty terrifying, and they change your view of how these systems behave. So I guess what I'm trying to get at here is, in trying to blindly merge these two imperfect systems, we're beginning to see issues with that human-machine collaboration, where we see new types of accidents. And maybe new types of accidents in the automotive domain, but not in the aviation domain, not in the process control engineering domain, or any domain that's used automation for a long time. Maybe we're destined to relearn all of these mistakes. And I think the reason that we're facing some of these issues is that in applying automation to this problem, the automotive industry is looking at this as a technology problem. And yes, of course, it's a technology problem. Otherwise, we wouldn't all be here. But there are many factors that contribute to that ecosystem. And humans, I would argue, are at the center of it. So I say my contention is that human factors today is as important in the development of self-driving cars as the technological aspects. And we should treat it with the same status. Now, over the years, we've been studying the behavior of hundreds of drivers in automation at the University of Leeds Driving Simulator. 
And we found that drivers' visual attention, so this is where they look and how they gather information from the environment during automated driving, is significantly more dispersed than in manual driving. And what this means is that drivers miss important safety-related cues when they're asked to resume control or when they're asked to interact with that system. And especially if there are subtle automation failures that come without warning. Now, what's more, some drivers will crash even if they're in control of the vehicle and even if they're looking at the threat. And this is because drivers need time to get back in the loop, as we say, both physically and cognitively. Our research shows that it's not about how quickly someone can regain control, it's about how well they understand that system and how early they can mitigate those risks. We've also seen the numerous videos of drivers falling asleep at behind the wheel of their automated driving system, tricking driver engagement torque sensors in the steering wheel with water bottles and oranges, or even with their hands while they're asleep. And what this tells us is that some drivers will take a chance. They will exploit a system for their own purposes as long as the design of that system allows it. But what this also tells us is that humans cannot fight against the natural evolution of attention. We did not evolve to be in these situations, picking up subtle changes in a very monotonous environment. So we are putting drivers in that situation and saying, how dare you fall asleep? A lot of drivers can't control that. So as we can see, we now have cars on the road that let drivers fall asleep. Yes, let drivers fall asleep. That's a decision that can be operated on areas, in areas and on roads they weren't designed to be operated on, and that are given names intentionally by manufacturers that inflate expectations, and this is not good enough. And what this is creating is situations where drivers are not guided to behave in a way that will see them as a collective benefit from the safety that automation promises, that we're promising. We're promising this to everyone. So we now have to strive to avert some of these scenarios that we've just seen. And whether we're coming at this from manufacturing, journalism, research, or legislation, we all have our responsibilities to fix these and avoid these problems. Our task is to educate the public. And that means being honest and accurate about where we are with this technology. Our task is to investigate what the users of these systems are capable of doing and of understanding, and in what context, and how this is shaped by a diverse population. Our task is to use this information thoughtfully to develop appropriate levels of trust and reliance in these systems, and so that drivers can form accurate mental models of how they will behave in different situations. And finally, our task is to reflect on whether we need a particular system or level of automation in the first place. And I say this because if safety is our, our real goal here, then maybe we should be talking a little bit more about active safety systems than automated driving systems. I want to end on this wonderful quote by Tom Sheridan and Raja Parasumaran in one of their papers, where they say that to an extent a system is made less vulnerable to operator error, it is made more vulnerable to designer error. And given that the designer of that system is also human, this simply displaces the locus of human error. So in the end, automation is really human after all. And I think they're right. And what I take from that is that as we move forward with building and reporting and researching and legislating this driverless future, we need to be aware of our own blind spots, of our unconscious biases, because they're going to be reflected in our piece of this big puzzle that we're building. And I think this also involves taking a broad view of the ecosystem in which these systems are operating, built around a central appreciation for how and by whom they will be used. So friends, for me, that's the why of driverless cars. It's us. So please, let us not forget that. Thank you. Thank you.